I'm here with Dr. Ronald Rensink at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and he's set aside some time to speak with us about some of his research interests, which largely center around visual attention. And so to start things off, Dr. Rensink, I'd like to ask you uh, what first drew you to the study of visual attention and how can understanding it help us to better understand psychology in general? Well, attention actually always interested me. It's something that always seemed central to how we see the kind of pictures we generated in our heads. So, uh, and also it was, uh, it seemed we could study it in some ways. There were some techniques. This is going back uh, a ways when I was a student. It seemed we could at least study it somewhat and not just talk about it, right? And the, um, yeah, the third thing was that it also seemed something that uh, machines couldn't do, robots couldn't do. And remember, I'm, I'm both in psychology and computer science. And so I had a great interest in uh, machine vision, in computer vision. And even to this day, uh, computer uh, machines don't have uh, attention. And so I was always interested in why is that? Is it useful to them? And, you know, why is it useful to us? And so from the point of view of just understanding ourselves and also creating better technology, I thought it was a really cool issue. A lot of your research is related to the idea of change blindness. So could you describe this phenomenon for us and sort of elaborate on how understanding this idea can help us understand the underlying mechanisms behind attention. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, change blindness is basically uh, a phenomenon that you don't see large changes unless you attend to them. So you could, for example, show a picture and then a brief blank in another picture, basically uh, similar to the first except something has been changed. Something's been removed or changed color or changed location. And then you can go back, show the original, the changed original change and you can do it under these conditions and um, it takes a surprising amount of time to do this and so the idea there is that you really need attention to see the change without it you just get this flashing stuff things just happen but you can't really see the change you, you can't track it right for attention is needed for this you create this object this event in space-time which you can then see transform and you have a constancy without that attention it's just stuff going by so it's kind of interesting because um, I came across it kind of accidentally back uh, in the old days when I first started on this. Attention had been known, of course, but most of the effects were very weak. They had been small effects to do with milliseconds of time or, you know, you're just slightly better at, at identifying something. And I think most people back then knew that attention was important, but the techniques weren't there to haul it out. So um, change blindness actually changed a lot because um, the, the situation. Because what you could do is you could suddenly uh, see how important attention was and you could also measure its effects because they were so strong you had a really good signal to noise ratio, right? You could get to play with it. You could do all kinds of things. You could do timing experiments. You could look at the, uh, the way experts differed from casual viewers. And all kinds of things opened up then. So it was a very uh, exciting time, a very exciting development. Cool, and yeah, I think it's, uh, it's fascinating that people can just miss these huge changes. And one of the arguments that's sort of arisen from this is just how um, sparse or limited our visual representation is. And what has your research uh, led you to believe on, on that area? Yeah, that's an interesting question, just how much is really represented in, in the brain. And um, it's actually got a couple parts to it. So uh, what you'll find is that people differ. Right now, it's a very active area of research. So we're right on the edge, right, the cutting edge of research when we talk about this. So some of what I say now may not be, uh, you know, okay. seem true 10 years from now. Um, but there's two parts. One is how much is represented at any moment, the sort of instantaneous, you know, content. Mm -hmm. And the other is how much we remember, okay, in, in order to, to create, uh, you know, to pick up the changes. So what you've got then are, um, in, in the first case, I believe that we have a we represent a lot. At any instant, as long as your eyes are open, you do have a lot of stuff. You've got light coming into your, your eyes. You represent a lot. It's there. These, these are all done before attention operates. You've got the back of your head. It's the you know, visual mm -hmm. cortex is creating all these edges and building things up. And in fact, you can build up a lot without attention. And so this continues to be built again and again. And as long as your eyes are open, this keeps getting built. It'll, it'll regenerate. And as soon as you close your eyes, it 
goes away, it fades away. And then we open them, it, it comes back on. So this is what happens without attention. This is what exists at any instant. Now the question then is, is how much is remembered? Okay, so when you walk into a room, you know, you turn your head, whatever, how much do you remember when you, you come back? And that, I believe, um, is relatively little. I think you remember some of it. You probably remember maybe a handful, maybe a dozen or so items where they are and maybe a little bit about what they are so you know, okay, there's a, you know, there's, there's a squirrel over there and there's a window over there and there's, there's a few things, right? You, you kind of know, uh, you get a rough idea. So you can always move your head back, you can move your eyes back to it, but you don't really have the content. Right? You don't have the actual dense representations. Uh, they don't stay. So when, in other words, when you have a picture in your head, it, it, it's very transient. You don't keep it like a, a photograph and just build them all up. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because there's no way we could store all that information in our head, right? Every, you know, 10 times a second you're taking a shot and, you know, millions of bytes of information and just again and again and again. You, you couldn't handle that. So in my opinion, there is some information Clearly, you know, we, there's a, we have memory, right? We, we, we go to school and, you know, there's a point to that. So you can actually remember some stuff, but it's nowhere near as much as you might think. You've also uh, described a phenomenon, and I think you sort of came up with it, Mindsight. And um, for our uninformed viewers, could you first of all just describe Mindsight and maybe also contrast it with Blindsight and just link it up to change blindness and attention? Yeah, yeah, the mind side effect is is, is is interesting one, and it's hard to know exactly what's going on with it. Uh, could, so you, I, could you actually just sort of give a give an overview of mind sight, maybe contrast it to blind sight? Yeah, it's, sure. Yeah, the, the mind side effect is really where you can get a sense that something is changing. So you can watch one of these flickering displays, for example, right? And what will happen is many people have a sense after a while that something is happening. So, in fact, that's how I first discovered it. It wasn't something I, I went after. It was one of these things that just happened. I, I would have people come in, and we'd show them these, um, these flickering displays and ask them, you know, well, tell us when you see the change. And, and most people would do this. And occasionally you get somebody who would come in and go, well, you know, do I, do I hit the button when I see the change or just when I know something's happening? And, and I'd say, well, no, you have to see it. You have to point to the location and what it is. And, and okay, you know, then they'd, they'd get it. And then a couple more people come by and someone else would, would do this. You know, well, what do you mean? You know, when I feel something happening or when I see it. So after a while, I, I thought, well, okay, let's just, you know, investigate this phenomenon. People seem to have a gut feeling that something is happening. But they, um, they can't have a picture of it. They don't really see it in that sense. So it seemed like there was two senses of the word seeing. There was, you know, being aware of it, like knowing that it's there, versus having a picture. And, and they're see, they seem to be distinct. So this is what Mindsight is about, is that is there a really a separate, if you like, submodality of vision, a separate subsystem that actually can let you pick up on these things to go with your gut feelings? Right? And if you uh, think about it, you know, a lot of people report, well, you know, I, I walked into a room and something was wrong. They just felt it. You know, or you can see an old friend and they've changed, but you don't know what, and you go, yeah, there's something that changed, but I, I don't know what, right? And I believe it may be related to this. So there may well be some memory in some form, in some system in your, in your brain, which then compares to the new one, right? And there's a mismatch. And this may be part of the reason we have uh, Mindsight. It's this mismatch that's being signaled. So you don't yet have attention on it. You can't see it. You don't have the picture. But there is sort of this memory which is now being probed and going, hey, you know, it's not quite what's in front of me. It's not quite what's in my memory. Well, how would you uh, compare and contrast Mindsight with Blindsight? Yeah, well, Mindsight is where you don't have a picture, but you still have a conscious experience of it. You still have some feeling that something is happening. In Blindsight, uh, typically, that is where you have no visual experience at all and no conscious awareness of all, at all. So it's completely as if you were blind. So with mind sight, you do have something. It's not a picture, but it's still something. Whereas in blind sight, there's basically nothing at all. One concern with uh, the study of this mind sight idea is that perhaps just because uh, these the participants assume there's going to be a change or they're, they're doing a demonstration in which changes are taking place that they're just going to falsely create this sixth sense because they think they should be seeing a change. How have you addressed that in your research? Yeah, that's a good uh, question actually. You really want to make sure that people just aren't hallucinating. And we can actually test this. So it is a worry, 
but you don't have to worry about it because uh, you can create control conditions where we've done this, in fact, where there are no changes. So what happens there is uh, you can bring someone into the lab and say, okay, you know, hit the button when you feel something changing, but they don't see it yet, right? So what happens is if they always feel they just, oh, I'm just going to, you know, say it because I should, um, then they'll respond to the uh, control ones, the, the no change conditions, as much as the others. Uh, and what we find is that most people, not all, there's a few people that are kind of wannabes that do kind of, oh yeah, I can feel it, and no, not really, you can measure this. But uh, a lot of people, in fact, will be able to tell when there isn't a change. So we tell people there's always a change, right? We say, okay, go in there, you know. And, and the nice thing about change blindness is it takes so long to get the change in many conditions that you can run it for like, you know, half a minute and then stop and people won't suspect that there never was a change. They'll go, oh, that was just a really tough one. So you, you can do this again and again. But some people are able to, uh, A, get the sense of things happening when it happens. But when it doesn't happen, they'll look at it for maybe five, ten seconds and they'll go, hey, I thought you said there's always be a change here and there isn't. So they can actually tell when they're not feeling it. Okay. And uh, your previous uh, comments reminded me of, a, of another uh, I believe it was one of your articles you referred to vision as sort of an intelligent hallucination or something like that uh, as a way of characterizing vision. Could you just sort of elaborate on that? Uh, sure. It's actually an old idea, really. It goes way, way back. The idea that a lot of what we have in our head, this is where it comes down to what's this picture in our head? Where does it come from? Right? And it's clear it's not an exact copy of what's coming in through our eyes. This much is, is, is clear. Uh, because even if you think about it, right, you've got a fovea, which is high resolution, and all the rest is blurry, right? It picks up color, all the rest is black and white. And you sure don't have this in your picture. So clearly it's being constructed at some level. And uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, illusions are the same thing, right? You actually see stuff that really isn't there. So what you've got, these are all descriptions of a hallucination. Right? Stuff that isn't there, it's not even what's on your eye. So at some point, you're kind of putting it together. So that's where the hallucination is. It's a construct. Where the intelligence comes in is that it really is something that reflects something about the world. It's not like, oh, there's weird Martians and stuff floating in space, right? It really is a hallucination that tells you something about the way the world is. So it's actually hel it's there to help you. Right? So it's not there to mislead you, it's actually to overcome the limitations of what's on your eyeball and you know, all these other crazy things out there and get you a picture of what's really in the world. So that's the sense I mean it. Oh, okay. cool. Um, and you mentioned uh, illusions and misleading and it kind of reminded me of uh, another article you wrote where you talked about uh, magic and sort of the relationship of, of magic to psychology and how understanding tricks that magicians use might help psychologists. So could you yeah, talk about yeah. that a bit? Okay, yeah, that's actually a natural development if you believe in this, you know, intelligent uh, hallucination uh, idea. Uh, it explains a lot about how magicians work because what they're effectively doing is they're controlling that hallucination. They've worked out ways to basically hijack your apparatus and make you see what they want you to see or not see what they don't want you to see, okay? So what you've got then is this... Uh, Clearly, it, it, it works. It's, it's, you know, it works on all kinds of people. It's, it's very robust finding that you can begin to, um, yeah, imagine all kinds of things happening or not happening, you know, coins, uh, you know, going through windows or whatever you like. And what they've done is they've taken over this hallucination apparatus, these mechanisms, and basically started making you see things. And, um, and everybody does it. Like I say, it's very strong. The effects are big. Most people, you know, fall for them. So I always thought of this as uh, not just a nice existence proof that, that this is the case, but also that we can turn it around and start to use these magic tricks as a way to find out what's going on. So what you'll find, for example, is that magicians are well aware of attention. So all these things of change blindness, for example, are just very simple forms of, you know, making the change invisible, unseeable to an audience, right? So magicians know all this. They can, in fact, they know to direct your attention here or here and away from what's going on here. So there's a natural fit now between what magicians do and what we as scientists have found. But the cool thing is magicians know a lot more. And so my hope is that we should uh, really be able to learn from them a lot more about what's going on with this hallucination generating apparatus, the particular ways it works, the systems involved, right? 
and that uh, these, in fact, are basically experiments. Magicians have been experimenting on people for centuries, right? They found what works. And so as scientists, that's where we should start. We should start talking with these guys and use some of their techniques and, and go after it further. Yeah, and yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, growing up, I always sort of saw like magician, magicians, and when they did tricks, I just figured it was the fact that they just they moved their hands so quickly and stuff that you couldn't see it even if you were looking at it. But it seems that it's almost uh, different. They can do whatever they want if they're pointing over in the you know the other direction. You know, you yep. can put a giant gorilla on the screen for five seconds. So you don't have to be fast if people aren't paying attention. Yeah, yeah. In fact, yeah. The the uh, the the interesting thing is that. This idea of the hand being faster than the eye is completely wrong. They're not. It's mm -hmm. just as you know, slow as anybody, maybe even a little bit slower. So speed has nothing to do with it. It's all attention control. And in fact, there's a great story about um, a famous magician about 100 years ago called Blackstone in England. He was one of Queen Victoria's favorite magicians. And um, he had this trick where he could make a goat disappear, or actually appear, sorry, it would appear in thin air. Just out of thin air, goat would appear. Pretty impressive, <laughs> right? He would just come up onto a, an empty stage, no trap doors, no nothing, and you know, suddenly there's a goat, right? And uh, this was quite the hit of Victorian England. And the way he did it was, is he actually um, uh, had the goat under his arm the whole time. And his assistant would first come out onto the stage and say, oh, we're going to get the great, you know, black stones appearing and la-di-da, set up a story right, set up your expectations, and then Blackstone would come by, you know, waving this great handkerchief. So this story would be, you know, directing people's attention, the handkerchief would then catch it. Meanwhile, the goat's under his arm, nobody is attending to it, nobody sees it. He gets out on stage, drops the handkerchief, right, releases their attention, and suddenly their attention goes to the goat, and they see it. So uh, a nice effect of that, a nice example of that effect, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rensing, for taking the time to speak with us. I learned a lot, I think our viewers learned a lot. So. Oh, well, it's been my pleasure. And uh, by the way, nice shirt. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.